is I'm going to share some of the, the biblical uh, concepts, the theological reasons behind what we're doing and why we're doing it. And so very quickly, uh, we can open our Bibles to the book of Acts. If you didn't bring a Bible, that's fine. We have a screen that's going to put everything up there for you. There's like crazy feedback coming off of this. Is this, like, is everything off? Yeah? Okay. We got to, it's driving me insane. <laughs> so I'll just yell louder, bring it down a little bit. But Okay, everybody hears me fine? Good, perfect. Feedback's gone. Magic just happened. All right. Listen to what um, was established in the book of Acts. One of the things that, uh, I, didn't, I didn't grow up in the church. I loosely grew up in the church, in the Lutheran church. But it was like, as soon as I got confirmed, it was like, I'm out of there. I don't want anything to do with this place. It's boring. Uh, it's religious. I just don't get it. And so I want nothing to do with it. And when I did come to Christ in my early 20s, uh, one of the things that excited me the most was that I got to know different Christians. And, and when I was trying to figure out how to shape my faith, I was like, who better to look to than other people of faith? But I very quickly found something out. The church is very cynical. The church is very critical. And it seems to be that that is what drives the Christian culture in many ways. Like, for instance, let's just have a heart check for a second. How many people walked into this place and criticized something? Something someone was wearing, something that has, has happened or changed, or, or, or whether the coffee was strong enough or, or not strong enough. Like, all these different things. How many people, if we were really honest, you don't have to put up your hand, because that would be confessing, and why would we do that? But how many people had a critical thought at some point this morning when they walked through the doors of the church? I can guarantee you that almost every one of us, at one point or another, had some type of critical thought. I actually, as I was walking around, could count more than 20 that I overheard. That's just me whipping through the halls trying to get ready for the service. And it's interesting because we don't even realize it. We don't realize it as a church, but when you're a new believer, you don't realize it in the beginning, but you find out very quickly. And so then there's this, this, this issue that happens in a new believer's heart that's like, I found Jesus, but I can't seem to find Jesus in the church. And that's a, that's a problem, isn't it? And so then I became a Christian pastor, which elevates that times 6,000, and and you begin to really turn to God, which is, I think, the direction he wants us to be in anyway. And so I've spent an awful lot of time in my life with the simple question of how do we transition the church to be a church of love? And so in Acts chapter 2, we have the early onset of the Christian church as we know it today. So Acts has happened, Acts chapter 2 has happened, Pentecost has happened, 3,000 people came to Christ in one sermon. Can you imagine? And this is their reaction. This is some of the things that they created. Okay, and one thing you need to understand is they had every right to be critical and cynical because you want to talk about change. Here is a group of Jews who have had a very structured faith their entire lives, and it's now about to be turned upside down. To some of them, it's a fulfillment that their Messiah has come, and it's just a continuation of their faith, and to others, uh, it's a brand new thing. But Jews and Gentiles, the different kinds of people at this time, they didn't like each other, they didn't mix well with each other, and it's at this moment that that starts to change. And so you want to talk about like disgruntled church meetings. You had like people who they were like, oh, that's a Gentile. They're unclean. Don't even eat with them. Don't even talk to them. And they're now sitting beside you in a chair. So you can imagine it goes beyond what color our chairs are and stuff like that. Like the, they had some serious issues at this time. But listen to the foundational principles that it, it forms as the believers form a community. 
It says this, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings. Now, they didn't devote themselves to the New Testament teachings because the New Testament didn't exist at the time. So they knew the Old Testament, but they were now relying on the teachings of the apostles who had been taught by Christ. And so what they're saying here, essentially, is that they devoted themselves to the teachings of Jesus and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. So right there, we just got a foundation, a picture of what the church looks like. Now, if we jump down to verse 46, it says they worshiped together at the temple each day. So we see this large gathering that happened, except it happened every day. Okay? So they gathered together at the temple each day. 3,000 people have been saved. This is a big meeting. They gathered at the temple each day, but then what? But they met in homes for the Lord's Supper Now, they met in homes for the Lord's Supper. It doesn't mean they met in homes and had an awesome roast beef meal, even though that's awesome, isn't it? Right? Yeah? It means that they met in homes for the Lord's Supper, meaning that the whole supper was centered on who Jesus Christ was, what Jesus Christ had done on the cross. Very different kind of meal than just fellowship around food. But then it said, they, they, what, what's the, what comes out of that? And they shared their meals with great joy and generosity. One of the things that I have noticed in the Christian church is we lack joy. We really do. We lack joy. The Bible says that literally you should be like that person who is just healed. If you were not able to walk. And someone was to come over and pray over you and you could instantly walk. Would there be joy in your heart? Because you've been healed, right? So you would find joy. You would be like, wow, this is amazing. Like, my life has been transformed. My life is about to change because now I can walk. But here's the thing, folks. The gospel of Jesus Christ transforms you in a much bigger way than the ability to walk. It saves you from you. So, but why do we react like, oh, I can walk. Cool. (laughs) When's Swiss Chalet? Right? If we turn to John chapter 15, I want to just tie this in very quickly before I turn the mic over to Emil. I want to read you a beautiful passage. I'm going to just point out a few things in this passage because I think that this passage gives us the answer to our problems. John chapter 15, Jesus gives a beautiful picture here. He says... To his apostles, I am the true grapevine. And my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit. Hmm. Interesting. And he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. That's the gospel. So you've already been puned and pu- pr- yep. <laughs> pruned and purified by the message I have given you. So then listen to what he says. Remain in me. That would allude to the fact that you maybe can stray away from remaining in him, right? He wouldn't be telling us remain in me if there was, a poss- if there was zero possibility that we couldn't stray from that. Now he's going to unpack that more. Remain in me, and then what? Well, then I'll remain in you. For a branch, listen very carefully, church, for a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine. And you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. 
Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. So he's like the, the you know, probably Peter's like, what? Jesus, I don't understand what you're talking about. So now Jesus is like going, okay, yes, Peter, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Like, let's walk through this, we'll be okay. That's what he's doing here, it's awesome. Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me, I in them. He's repeating himself, isn't he? Note to self when looking at the Bible. When they repeat themselves, pay attention to what they're saying. They're repeating themselves on purpose. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. Again, he would allude to the fact that there would be people claiming to be disciples, but they're not true disciples. That should make you uncomfortable. That's alluding to the fact that, and he does in other passages talk about that, that there is those that will say, Lord, Lord, but yet I don't know them. This brings great glory to my Father, he says. I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love. So now he's telling us how we go about doing this. Obey his commandments. Except I want you to listen very carefully of what that commandment is. He says, when you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obeyed my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I've told you these things, listen, so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. Now, this is my commandment, he says. This is it. You ready for it? This is how you be a true disciple of Jesus Christ. He's going to give it to us. Love each other. In the same way, I have loved you. Now listen to what he says here. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friend. You are my friends. If you do what I command. Now that's a great friendship, isn't it? You want to be friends with me? Do as I say. But that's not exactly what he's actually saying, is it, folks? You can read it that way. But what he's saying is, you want to be friends with me, we're going to love each other. If you don't want to love each other, we're not going to be friends. You are my friends, and if you, if you do what I command, I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends. Since I have told you everything the Father told me, you didn't choose me, I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit. There's that theme over and over again. This theme, this call for the disciples to produce lasting fruit. Fruitfulness matters. Fruitlessness matters. He says, produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. And he repeats this. This is my command. Love each other. In, in just a moment, Tamil's going to come up and she's going to present to you uh, about the concept of why we've shifted her portfolio and about where we're moving to as far as how our community connects with one another. Because we feel that out of these passages, what it shapes is, is that we need to become a community that loves one another. And when we become a community that loves one another, we in turn can become a community that loves our community. And then because of the love we have for our community, we begin to then have a love for 
our province and for our country and for the world. And we become less ignorant. See, love makes you less ignorant. And this command to love each other, it, this is a learned behavior. It needs to be practiced. Like, like, well, I like to believe that my wife instantly loved me upon sight. <laughs> but that would be my imagination. <laughs> Love takes work, doesn't it? You know the word disciple, we, we, we call a disciple a learner. It's the worst thing we ever did. Because we then in our context say a learner is here. We need to now memorize scripture. We need to know, we need to know Jesus by his theology, by the theological works, by, by reading scripture and, and, and learning it. If you memorize a scripture, but that scripture never speaks to you, it never convicts you, it never changes your heart, all you did was read words on a paper. If you learn theological concepts, but you never learn to love, you're not a disciple at all. A learner in the times of Christ was them following a rabbi, Jesus. And they literally learned everything about him. Everything. They didn't just learn about his history. They didn't just learn about, about the simple things that he taught. They learned everything about Jesus. What made Jesus tick? It was their goal to learn it. And that's what a true disciple is. Somebody who learns to love as Jesus loved because we are disciples of Jesus Christ. So we're not just learning here. If anything, we're learning here. And so what we want to do as a church is usher in an environment to allow you the opportunity to make that decision. Because love is a decision. And so we want to give you the environment. The, what, what I'm saying is not all will choose this. You know, some people come to church to be entertained and to critique and then to move on with their week. What we want is disciples who are digging in and learning love. And the way to do that, what Acts tells us, is in community. So that's the, the, the quick biblical version of why we're going where we're going. Essentially, what we want to do is give you the tools to learn to love. And guess what? A loving heart becomes less cynical and less critical. So I'm going to ask Tamil to come on up and uh, I will give her the microphone. All right. So, thanks. So, what does this all mean? Where is this all going? Right? This is the, the question that we're all asking. So the reality is that what Jesus is, is describing here, this image that we have of, of the, the vine and the branches and fruit coming naturally and organically from this connection that we have to Christ, what he's describing is incredibly countercultural. Right? It goes against the way that the world works. We live in an incredibly busy, fast-paced culture. Am I right? Do you guys feel that? We kind of live in this state of frenzied busyness. And we live in a culture that's very connected, right? We've never been more connected. We carry around these little gadgets. We're constantly texting each other and Instagramming each other and seeing what each other are eating for breakfast on our phones, on Instagram, that sort of thing, right? We're so connected. But at the same time, we're so disconnected. There's so much loneliness in our culture, right? Despite this, this, um, this instant access that we have kind of to each other's lives, it's like we, we, don't, we lack that deeper connection, okay? And so this is kind of what we've been uh, praying through as we've been talking about where we're going um, as a church. And so what Jesus is, is describing here, it, it sounds really good, doesn't it? It sounds like a life that's characterized by peace, well, it sounds like a life that's filled with love. Right? It, it sounds like it's, a, it's the kind of life that's characterized by joy. 
right? This is the kind of life that we all want to live. But the reality is that even in the church, a lot of times, it seems far away. Right? It does, it, sometimes it seems like uh, when we come together on Sundays, like it's just another thing that we have to do in our week because we feel kind of obligated. We don't want God to be mad at us, so we should probably go to church. Right? We feel like sometimes our devotional time is just another thing that we should do to make sure that God's you know, still giving us the thumbs up. And so there's a little bit of a disconnect um, in, in what Jesus described as the, the way of life for us as Christians and, and the way that we often um, live our lives and experience our lives. And I think that in our conversations um, at, at the leadership, we've been talking about how a lot of times church can be very heady. It's very uh, focused on, on what we're learning about, right? And I'm, I'm making a, a generalization, but in the, in the Western uh, church right now, that's um, that's, it's a really big focus, right? Where we come, um, sometimes we come to church like we go watch a movie, right? You come, you sit down, you spectate, uh, you take in what's being said, and then, uh, then you, you go home, right? Maybe you have some opinions about it. Um, and that's sometimes the way that we, uh, we do our devotional time as well. We, we read, we try to um, expand in our knowledge, um, but we're not necessarily changed by what it is that we're reading. Because if knowledge could actually transform us, we would all be incredibly healthy, right? We'd eat tons of vegetables. We would never go to Wendy's, right? We would all be well-rested. We would have no bad habits. We, we all do things that we know we shouldn't do all the time. So knowledge is not the answer, okay? Knowledge is not our solution. We can't change ourselves. Um, I've recently read a book, and it's a book we've been talking about um, a lot in, in our, all of our leadership teams, actually. Uh, it's called uh, The Eternal Current, and it's by Aaron Nequist. And so he gives this illustration. So this will kind of help give a little bit of a picture of um, what it is that I'm talking about. Okay, so he gives an example of a young woman who decides that she's going to run, uh, or she's going to do a triathlon. Okay, so she's been pretty pretty unhealthy, she wants to make some changes in her lives, she wants to get into shape, and she's going to run a triathlon, and so she goes to a fitness center, right? She steps out, she makes a decision, she's like, you know what, it's time, I'm going to make some changes here, and she goes to a fitness center, and then she arrives, and there's a really uh, warm, inviting team there that welcome her in, and they usher her into this big auditorium, okay, and she sits down, and there's like a U2 cover band, so there's this really cool music, and then there's a motivational speaker who comes, and he talks about all of the benefits of getting in shape. Okay, so she's like, okay, this is going to be awesome. This is, this is awesome. I want to get into shape. I'm inspired. And then she goes home, and then she goes back the next day. And the same thing happens again. She sits down. She hears another uh, inspirational message about how important it is to be healthy and to get into shape. And then the following day, it's the same. So every day she goes and she hears these, these messages about, uh, about getting in shape. So have any, of you, have, you, have any of you ever used like videos as workouts? No one? Okay. I do. I use these videos. And um, the reality is if, if I was to just play these videos uh, on the TV while I'm like eating like chips, they're probably not going to serve their purpose, right? So there's a reality that... There's an element of our faith that, that we, we need to actually practice some practices to learn to be the kind of people who, who live out our faith in, our, in just how we go about our daily lives. And so we've been kind of praying through how to create space in our community as a church for this to happen. And this has been uh, behind all the conversations around the shift that's happen happening um, in my role. And um, yeah, so I'm, I told you before I'm excited about it and I kind of made a joke about being excited to uh, pass the teenagers <laughs> over to, to youth pastor Jeff. Um, <laughs> but, but I actually love, I love you guys. I love the teenagers. That's not what it is. I'm really excited because I've never been more convinced that this is God's direction for our community, that God is leading us um, into this deeper connection with him, him and with each other in, in our church body. And so I'm really excited to see uh, what he's going to do this year. 
and we met, um, the deacons and elders met yesterday, and when we left, everyone was just like vibrating because we're all excited because God is, is moving. So it's good stuff. <laughs> so let me tell you um, some of the things that you're going to start to see happening and some of the roles that I'm going to start uh, shifting into. Um, and just also, just so you guys know, the, the reality is that on paper, like this transition doesn't make total sense. Like, our kids and our youth ministries are, like, growing. <laughs> but um, God is calling us to something new, and I, we really believe that as we as a church uh, grow deeper in, in Him, in the Spirit-filled life, that, that God's pulling those pieces together, and because it's in His hands, everything's going to work out. So I get excited when things don't make sense, because I'm like, yeah, God, God can do it. So, so it's cool. So uh, what's this going to look like? Um, last year, you started us hearing us talk about uh, the practice. You guys, if you were here, do you remember the practice? Some of you came to the practice. So this was a service that we started to, to have once a month, on the last Sunday of each month. And the, the whole service was centered around um, learning some spiritual disciplines, learning ways of relating to God. Okay? There's a, a reality that in the evangelical church, we've really... Um, put a push on quiet time, right? We give people this one tool. The way you relate to God is you read your Bible, you journal, often in the morning, and then that's it. That's kind of like your, your daily bread. That's what you need to start your day with, and then you get running. The reality is that throughout history, Christians have practiced a whole lot of different spiritual disciplines, and sometimes that quiet time isn't enough. Sometimes we need to relate to God in a different way. Um, if you're in a relationship, you probably know that if you only communicated to your husband through text messaging, you wouldn't have a very dynamic relationship. Right? In relationships, in human relationships, there's times where we need to talk. There's times where we need to just be quiet together. Right? There's times where you do things together. You participate in activities together. Our relationships are, di are dynamic, and it's the same with our relationship with God. And so this year we're really going to be digging in deeper uh, into the practice. And so that service, we're going to be kind of tweaking a few things. We're really going to try to create space there uh, for a very worshipful experience. Um, we really feel that, that we're, we're shaped as we worship God. And so definitely would encourage you um, to, to come out to that this year. And in addition to that... We're going to start to, uh, you, you may start to see some practices incorporated in uh, different areas. So Sunday services, um, there might be some space where it's quiet. And we're asking you to, to pray, um, pray for something. Or we're guiding you through um, some reflection or things like that. So not, not ways that are going to make you super awkward or, or freaky or anything like that. But ways of just creating space for you to connect with God. So, because that's, that's central uh, to, to what we are doing here. Um, yeah, so, uh, oh, I also wanted to, so there's a, a quote that I read yesterday and I wanted to share it with you. It's by Richard Foster, and he says, superficiality is the curse of our age. And he wrote that 20 years ago, actually, initially. So he, this was before, like, s cell phones were carrying like Instagram and Facebook in our pockets all the time. Superficiality is the curse of our age. Do you agree with that? Yeah. So the, the reality is that um, if we're not intentional, if we just go with the flow of our culture, we won't naturally stumble upon a life with purpose and depth and meaning. This, this life that Jesus is describing in John 15. It won't happen by accident. So it's just a way of being intentional. Um, all right, life groups. So I know that a lot of you have been anxiously awaiting uh, for our small groups to kick off this year. Um, and we have been uh, dreaming about what this could look like. Um, Gord has been so faithfully and patiently leading our small group ministries for, for a few years. Um, and we've, been, we've recognized for quite a while that this is an area in our church that we need to really pour some um, attention and some resources into. Um, because in a way we've kind of, um, the, the way that our small groups were running, 
they were, there were some people who were really engaged with them, but it wasn't necessarily a format that, that everyone was able to connect with. And so uh, we have small groups that have been running, that are going to continue running in the format that they were, because uh, that was really working for um, some people, but we're also going to be expanding um, what we're doing. So we really believe that as a community, we're called to do life together. Okay, and, and in small groups, some of the uh, mistakes that I think we make, I'm not talking about Evergreen specifically, but as the church, when we, when, we're, when we do small groups and stuff like that, is that we, again, can be really focused on the cognitive. So even if we're not doing an academic study, we're, just, we're doing a practical life study, we're still just studying <laughs> relevant topics, but not necessarily integrating them into our lives. So sometimes we make the mistakes where small groups can be really um, focused on, on, what, on the cognitive. And then other times we make mistakes where the mistake that um, small groups can be just entirely focused on uh, care, on caring for each other, and they can lack that um, Christ-centered focus. Right? And so we wanted to, uh, we, we were really uh, praying about how to create space for meaningful Christ-centered connection to happen in a way that um, everyone could kind of plug into. And so um, we have uh, changed the language around small group ministries. So we're calling them life groups. Okay, and the reason for that is just because there's a new vision, right? So I met with um, Gord and Trish and, and Pastor Jeff, and we've been really working through where we want to go with this. And we're calling them life groups because we're doing all of life together. Okay, and really all of life together in a way where we're pointing each other towards living deeper into our, our relationship um, with God. So what's this gonna look like? Um, almost anything, okay? So whereas before our small groups had a very uh, clear format, typically they would meet once a week um, on a certain evening or a certain time um, on the weekend or whatever, uh, and they would go through a specific topic we're changing to a model that's a lot more fluid. So um, we're looking right now for people who are interested in, in leading a small group and a life group, which is a form of small group. <laughs> uh, all falling under the bracket of small group ministries. So, um, so yeah, so you might be thinking like, well, I, and I've heard this, I'm, I'm not a really good teacher, so I don't know if I could lead, you know, a life group. But maybe you are really passionate about having meaningful life conversations with people and you love to cook. Okay, so one possible format for a life group could be that you could meet once a month with a group of people and you could have some launch questions, um, some questions that spark conversation about where has God been showing up in your lives? And where do you need God to show up in your lives? Where do you need to put yourself in God's presence? And then praying together. Okay, maybe... Uh, you really like playing golf and you know some other people who do as well so you maybe have a life group where you play golf every week and then have you know have some meaningful conversation during that time um, that's that's focused so really the key is that we're looking for in uh, leaders as you're thinking about whether this is something you might be called to is that desire to grow in your own relationship with Christ and to, to draw other people deeper into their relationship with Christ. And so I'm going to be working cl uh, closely with small group leaders, with life group leaders. Um, so there will be a lot more support uh, and resources and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, we really wanted to make sure that we're equipping you as people who are caring for small groups of, um, of people to, to feel like you're able to lead well. And so there's, yeah, there's going to be a lot of, um, of resource there available to you. So, at, so just so you know, so this is, uh, you're seeing up here our website, which became live at midnight <laughs> on the internet. So this is our new website. And later on, I'm going to tell you about how, you, how to get connected with this, okay? So, but for now, just kind of be thinking about whether this is something you might be um, interested in. So uh, in addition to, to our life groups, we also have study groups. And so we've, we basically we just separated it. So life groups are those long, ongoing re relationships that you're meeting over the long haul, pretty much. Study groups are going to be shorter term, 
and they're going to be focused on a specific topic. So Pastor Jeff, for example, might teach a six-week study on interpreting the Bible, that sort of thing. We have our um, ladies' Bible study coming up, so that's a, a, how many weeks is it? Eight weeks? Eight weeks. So that's a study group. So it's a short uh, period of time where they're looking at a specific topic. Um, so there's, there's that opportunity as well. So it is important. Learning is a piece of life. We're not saying, like, don't learn, don't grow your brain. We're saying this is one small component of our faith, is learning. Um, and so we still want some topical studies to be available to you. Yeah, and the next piece of it, um, we're really excited about as well. So uh, when, when uh, Doug um, communicated where my role is shifting, he, he mentioned that there would be more engagement with community partners. And so um, the, we don't know exactly what that, this looks like, and so that's why it's, it's still a little vague. But part of my role is going to be to facilitate more engagement in our community outside of the church. Okay, so when, um, in Luke 4, Jesus kind of gives his mission statement for his ministry. He stands up in the temple and he reads a scroll. And what does he say? Do you remember? He, he said that he's come to bring good news to the poor. What else? Recovery of sight to the blind. He, he came to set the captives free. Right? So he calls us to, this, to participate in this ministry with him. We're called to invite people into the kingdom of God where blind people see, where people who were enslaved are set free, and where there's good news to people who need good news. We're called to be light in this world where there's darkness and in places where there's no hope, we're called to go in and, and communicate that there's hope because the kingdom of God is available to everyone. And so we've, at Evergreen, we've had uh, the last little while, we've kind of had to work through um, setting up some structures. We've kind of, kind of been focused inside to make sure that we had the structures, stru 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 structures <laughs> in place to keep doing the ministry that we do in a sustainable way so that there's leadership to do that ministry. And so we're really pumped because that's kind of set up now so we can like go and do some engagement with the community in a more intentional and uh, deeper way. And so um, we'll probably see more specifically what that looks like getting into the new year once some of this other stuff is kind of rolling. Uh, I can tell you a couple of things. Um, it will, so the engagement with community partners. We have two local partners right now. Um, we connect with Church Out Serving, with Eric and Adele and Victor, or, yeah, Virginia, sorry, <laughs> with V. And uh, th so they can expect that I'll be um, showing up and knocking on their doors and calling because we're really going to um, be engaged with their ministry there. And we also partner with, um, with Dan at the Youth Center. I don't think Dan's here this morning. So it'll involve community partnerships in a way where relationships can happen organically, and we can uh, jump in with where relationships are already being formed in our community. And it w it's going to involve... Uh, it's going to involve doing ministry in a way that... We're, okay, so we're not going to be, like, throwing Bibles at people on the street, like, going downtown, like, throwing Bibles at people, or, like, yelling at them with, like, a bullhorn. We're going to become neighbors. Okay? Jesus calls us to be neighbors. And so if you guys know, um, some of you know and some of you don't, as long as I've been working here, and I've, I've been working here for five years, uh, which I can't, I can't believe I've been here for five years, but um, so for the last year I've been working full-time, but prior to that I was... Uh, part-time. And during that entire time that I've been here, I've also been working at the Good Shepherd, which is an organization um, in Hamilton. So first I worked out of a shelter there, and then I um, started working as like in a community mental health role. And so I still do that like on the side as a hobby sometimes on weekends and stuff like that. <laughs> and so I'm really passionate about engaging with uh, people in our, in our communities who are marginalized. Okay, and I really, um, I really feel and I've really observed that sometimes the church, sometimes we, we mean to help, um, but we can do it in a way where we're not giving people dignity. Because when we go in and we um, throw Bibles at people or we just give them some money but we don't care to learn their name, we're not showing them dignity. And so whatever it looks like as this kind of unfolds, um, we're going to be 
learning people's names and their stories and, and loving them and becoming good neighbors. So, yeah, so it's pretty exciting. Um, yeah, so you'll hear more, more about that as it kind of takes shapes, takes shape. So, uh, before I hand the mic back to Jeff, I am going to show you uh, our new website. So, um, yeah, this was, we, normally when people like launch a website, they make sure it's all like totally fine tuned and beautiful before it goes up. This was kind of like uh, on Tuesday. <laughs> um, it's like, I bet we could do this by Sunday. <laughs> So, um, and there it is. So we really just wanted you, you to have a, um, all the opportunity in the world to connect with where we're headed. And so this, we've found a, a format of a website that is really easy to engage with. So it's really easy for you to go on to see what's happening. It's gonna be kept up to date because it's really simple to keep up to date. And thank you to Phil for keeping us um, <laughs> as up to date as he could, but sometimes we track faster than we can send Phil text messages. <laughs> so so it, what I'm telling you is that it's easy enough that Jeff and I can add stuff to it. And that has to be pretty simple for that to be true. So um, yeah, so when you log on to evergreenheights.org, this is what you're going to see now. And um, yeah, so that's cool. You can kind of scroll down and those are some different pages that are highlighted. But if you're interested in getting connected with uh, our like life groups or study groups or you're serving, what you're gonna go to is connect. Oopsies, Jeff warned me this would happen. Ah. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna go this way, but you can just go to connect and then click on life groups. I'm gonna go that way because my fingers are not quick enough. Okay, so if you click on life groups, then you'll come to this page here. And what we're looking for right now um, is people who are interested in leading a life group. And then we're going to um, gather the leaders together, cast some vision, and start letting you know about the life, the life groups that are um, unrolling as they become available. So if you're interested in leading or hosting, of course, you can stop by the Info Hub still. Um, so if you are not technologically inclined, we are by no means <laughs> taking that from you. That's totally fine. But um, some people are more comfortable checking stuff out at, at home from a distance and then engaging that way. So if you're interested in leading or hosting, you can come online and you can submit it. Oh, it's, it's so hard to see. I swear on your computer screen, <laughs> it'll be very clear and visible. It's just that we need a new projector. <laughs> but you can, put your, you can just put your name in there, indicate what you're interested in, hit submit, and then I'll get it and uh, somebody will be in touch with you. Um, you could also let me know if you have any questions. And if you're interested in joining a life group, so as they become available, you can come online to the same um, spot and you can click explore life groups. And um, it'll, it, it is, you can see, it is working. There we go. Okay, so can you guys see that? A little? A little, okay. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's pretty cool because you can come onto this page and you can see what life groups are available and you can actually like engage with this map. There we go, that probably helped a little bit. So you can see where the life groups are. Right now there's one like at the church. These are both Tamil's pretend life groups. Um, <laughs> there's one at the church and there's one kind of in the north end of town. So if you want to figure out what the life groups are doing, you would just click on one. Um, so this life group, they're gonna eat sandwiches and talk about living out their faith in the workplace. So I like sandwiches. So I'm gonna join this group. And you can hit your email address. Woo, oh, sorry guys. And then I was gonna type a funny message, but I'll spare you the time. I know, but good thing they pretend, right? <laughs> okay, so then it's that easy. So then, like, as I just clicked that, then the leader of your group would have received a notification that you're interested in joining. Um, if, if groups are up, it means that they're open. If groups are closed, we mark them as closed and you don't see them. So it's going to be a pretty cool, easy way for you to engage and kind of learn about what's being done on an ongoing basis so that it kind of, at, you know, if new, newer people come and want to get plugged in, they can do that later on um, in the year as well. So... 
here we go again. Um, yeah, study groups, it'll be the same thing. Come down to explore study groups. And that one's, this is actually a real group that's happening. It's Carol's Ladies Bible Study. So pretty cool. So you could join there if you wanted to as well. Um, so yeah, so go home and, and explore the site and see how you can uh, become engaged that way. Um, if you're interested in serving, say for instance at Kids Club or Sunday School, uh, that's available here too. So, so yeah, so there's lots of ways to connect and... Um, just, yeah, I just want to leave you with the challenge. As I've, like, over the last few months, God's really been um, challenging me to pay attention to the op opportunities that I have to engage that I just don't because I feel like I'm too busy or I feel like I just want to stay comfortable and I'm afraid that, like, that, you know, like it's going to be awkward or whatever. So I think that if, if we pay attention, there's moments all throughout the day where, where we're given opportunities to engage and um, I've been challenged to try to pay attention and to just ask God to, sh to point those moments out to me and in those moments to engage. Because when we engage, that's when God's able to, to work through us. That's when we're paying attention to his spirit so that he can produce the fruit in us right? as we're connected to that vine. So, yeah, I'll invite Jeff to come on up. So on, on the website, you can access uh, all the sermons, both in video format as well as audio format and so on and so forth. Uh, so what does all this mean? Well, that passage talked about Jesus being the vine, that Jesus is the vine that connects the branch. And so I don't know a whole lot about growing grapes in a vineyard, but uh, from what I read and had explained to me is that a branch can't grow without a vine. And the reason a branch can't grow fruit without a vine is because the vine is the lifeline of that branch. Well, how does that work? What happens is, is there's roots, and the roots soak up the water and the minerals and all the different things in the soil, and then go up the vine and spread out and feed the branch. So the concept here, to simplify this for you, is that there, I want you to picture this. We've talked about a flowing river, but in this passage, we can talk about the flowing of the sap. That without the sap flowing through the vine, we're dead. We can't produce fruit. It's literally impossible. And what the passage says is exactly that. But what it, it says then is what happens? What does the farmer do? Now, the farmer's God. What does the farmer do? Gathers up the dead branches and throws them in the fire. That's what my father-in-law loves to do, is farm and build fires. <laughs> what I want you to see through all of this is that it's all connecting to the vine. So like if you go out and you play golf, but you're never, you're just like, hey guys, and then you're, you know, like chucking clubs hitting trees, it's like golfing with me. Um, but you're never like talking about life. You're never like engaging with the flowing sap of the vine. Then and it's just not, it's not a life group. You're just a bunch of people who are trying to succeed at golf. You won't. You ever played golf? <laughs> it is the most frustrating game on the planet, right? You, you very rarely will you ever connect. But when you're connected to the vine and you begin to express what God's doing in your life as you're playing golf, you connect. And when you connect, the sap is flowing and it begins to bear fruit. And that fruitfulness teaches us how to love each other. So you see a very simple analogy of what... Now, imagine I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do life myself. Like, I'm an introvert, right? I generally hate people. And so um, I'm going to do life by myself. I just want to study because I'm that person. I'm cognitive-based, right? Like, except my, my doctorate's in practical theology, so the other theologians hate my guts, right? Because when we get in these, these academic arguments, so I'll present a paper to them, and, you know, the, one side of the room agrees with me, the other side of the room doesn't, and I have to defend which 
of you know, my opinion on how right it is. It's an awesome exercise. Um, I'll constantly say, well, that, that to, a, to a regular theologian, that's wonderful, but how do, how do I live that? Right? You run 100 pages, and I can't live any of it. So practical theology is what the church lives, right? And that is that flowing sap, that, that as we've referred earlier, that river that flows, the river of grace that flows, that, that all of this is connected to. So it's not just a new website. It's not just a new gimmick on join a group and let's be friends. It's not like that at all. It's about intentionally being connected to the vine. If it just becomes about, let's just be friends, let's just hang out together, like that's not connected to a vine, which means it's dead. It's a useless exercise. But when it's connected to the vine, it flows, the branch produces fruit, and then God, the farmer, will trim those branches. That's fun, eh? Right? That, that moment where you're, like, you're the branch, it's like, ouch! What just happened there? Well, the farmer just clipped off a piece that might have been dying. Why did he do that? It makes us more fruitful. And when you're doing that together, you, this is again from Scripture, you take on one another's burdens and the pruning process doesn't seem nearly as painful because we have the sap flowing from the vine helping us to produce fruit. And so we're doing this practically. We're going to teach you about spiritual disciplines. What does the Bible teach us? Not about what to memorize, but about what to actually practice, what to live. What is worship? Answering those questions. What is the gospel in itself? Answering those questions. We may do that in a study group, but then we need to transfer that into practical theological thinking. So I'm really excited about where this could take our community, but here's the reality. I say could because it's really up to you. We can create the environment. We can, ha- we can plant the orchard for you, or vineyard. Norfolk's got more orchards than it does vineyards, right? So we can plant all of that for you, but if you don't connect to the vine, like I can get out duct tape and try with everything I got. I do that every Sunday where I stand up here with my duct tape just pleading, please attach yourself to the vine. Find the joy that the scriptures are talking about in your hearts because we need to be responding to God, the flow of that vine, like we just got healed and we can walk again. When we're, when we're kind of like, oh, cool, I can walk. I'm not sure you're experiencing the flow of the sap. Maybe you're one of those branches that's just kind of dangling, trying to hold on, hoping the farmer doesn't come by and just write you off. What's his command? wow, we just went through an amazing cognitive exercise. (laughs) How do we do that? We do it together. We learn to love through one another, attached to the flowing sap of the vine. The big idea today, and I'm going to need it up on the screen because I don't have it in front of me, Doing life together keeps us connected to Jesus Christ, the vine. Did you notice that in the passage? That the, this, this concept of in Acts, doing life together, this is actually what keeps us connected to that vine. It gives us life. It creates unity and teaches us to love each other. These loving connections are what produce the harvest. So we've strategically worked through, we've, we've uh, you know, moved to Meal's job description into that and we're making different sacrifices in that area to, to, because we feel this is just so important. I also think we're moving Tamil into her area of giftedness, which is also very important. 
But it's really all about keeping you connected to that vine. So that one Sunday when I walk up and say, hey, it's Testimony Sunday, I want somebody to come up and tell me what God's doing in their life right now. We don't get this. I get like 10 people run up and grab the microphone because God's active in your life every day. You just need to begin to notice it. But you can't notice it if you're sapless, if you're a dead branch lying on the ground. We should clean up those branches someday. We don't like that, eh? If the church says, let's clean up the dead branches, what does that mean? Right? We're like, wait a minute. <laughs> Accountability might happen. Our dream, folks, is that you will love Jesus and that the love of Christ will flow out from you and produce a harvest. That's it. It's no fancy gimmick. It's right out of the Bible. We gave you tools with websites and things like that. If you aren't able to access the internet or if you struggle with computers or different things like that, well, you're just not allowed to be involved. <laughs> I'm kidding. Go to the hub. They have a computer. They can pull this up for you. They can ask you how to spell your name and type it in. They can act like they're you, but not being you. Don't let that, if those excuses come into your mind, you're, you're trying to be a dead vine. Stop. Right? Remember the cynicism? It's, it's for all of us, me included. I'm probably the worst. Don't let the cynicism hold you back from connecting to the vine. There is zero reason to not connect. Zero. Zero.